And this is the question I often start with asking, and that is, who agrees that mind and body are mutually connected, mutually interactive, and mutually influential? Anybody? <laughs> the difficult question is, socially is, does anybody disagree with that premise? Okay. I never get a no on that. It is just uh, like almost a common assumption now that anybody in the field of somatic psychology is going to base their work on the fact that mind and body are really mutually interactive. It's in, in the field of psychology, it's a radical idea, actually, because its implications condition a different way of working. In, in the, the radical attitude shift away from traditional psychotherapy is that whenever you engage the body, you're also engaging the psychological and emotional activities of that person. Whenever you engage or do an intervention that's psychologically or emotionally oriented, it's going to automatically affect the body. Now, this is good news because what you can do is you can enter into the system from a somatic point of view. And in doing so, what you're doing is you tend to avoid some of the immediate ego-based psychological defenses that arise. And the good news about that is you can get under the radar of those defenses to start to input new information or discover new information and also to build new resources. Now my work, which I call psychophysical therapy, is what I call resource-based psychotherapy. That the purpose of the work is to discover what resources are missing, and if that person had those resources, uh, how would it open up or change what it is they're coming to therapy to work with. So instead of it being um, oriented towards a cathartic uh, release process, you may well find me working with something that's pretty juicy and then suddenly I will shift away from it. Instead of going towards more uh, ab reaction, I will shift it towards what is the resource that this person had that they could really accomplish their goals. So I might actually move away from a juicy piece uh, in order to build a resource that's going to allow them to accomplish what they want. Because I see that, you know, any, any experienced therapist can always kind of recognize or often recognize something that if they push that button, they're going to get an emotional response. The emotional response creates a release, which will feel good in the moment to that person. But it doesn't necessarily support transformation in the long run. Transformation happens when new options arise. So my model of healing is this, is that wounding occurs when there's a lack of resources, the lack of options for that person to have. And this is true with just developmental wounding, it's true with some kind of insults in your adult life, it's true in trauma. You know, for example, um, <clears throat> if you have um, early physical abuse, let's say your father was very disturbed or very aggressive and would beat you or shame you, if you had the resources to stand up to that person at that time and say, no, this is inappropriate, you can't behave this way, um, and be able to you know, enforce that particular boundary, then the wounding wouldn't really have happened. It would have been an uncomfortable situation. Uh, you may have changed some patterns based on it, but it wouldn't have been traumatizing. The same thing if, there was, if you grew up in a family where there was shaming. Uh, if you would say, no, you can't talk to me that way. I deserve respect and caring. If you disagree with me, let's talk about it. But as a child, you don't have that resource. You don't have that strength. And so a wound happens. That wound automatically, because of this idea of the interface between mind and body, that wound is going to manifest in the body. It's going to manifest emotionally in some way, and it's going to manifest psychologically. So therefore, when I start to work with somebody, I am wanting to hear their story the way any psychotherapist would. But I'm also wanting to see the form that that story takes in their body. The body gives form to the mind's story. I'm going to say it again. The body gives form to the mind's story. That's what bodies do. They give form. <coughs> They create the physical form, the physical structure of a psychological or emotional reality. This is always the case. <coughs> it's called psychophysical parallelism. 
What happens psychologically, what happens physically, needs to be roughly in alignment with each other. It is very disconcerting if we hold one attitude and our body holds a different attitude. You know, for example, and I'm going to feel a lot of questions about this because this is a small enough group. <clears throat> I want you simply to come into physical flexion, which is this coming forward, rolling your shoulders in. Don't exaggerate it too much, but just feel your feet on the ground, but roll forward and roll your shoulders in, and then just look up at me. And I want you to say, I'm empowered to accomplish what I want in my life. <laughs> it doesn't fit, right? <clears throat> So, and the reason it doesn't fit is there's a lack of congruence between those two. They need to fit. If you ever want to prove this, walk around like this for an hour or two. It won't even take that, maybe 10 minutes, and you're going to start to feel a little depressed. If you hold this posture for a long period of time, you will become much more depressed. Why? Because this is the form of depression. And there is a congruence between the two. The same thing is true in interaction. <clears throat> if I am in a group of people that are continually holding a very negative attitude, maybe there's shaming, maybe there's criticism back and forth or whatever, I will find myself taking the form of a defense against that shaming or that criticism. I'll be tightening, I'll be guarding in some way. I'll be restricting something. That restriction might happen on a core level or it might happen more in our periphery. So because this is somatic-based psychotherapy, <coughs> I'm using the anatomy a lot. So you'll see, I mean, all this stuff is up because we're in the middle of a training on somatic resourcing. So the core of the body is basically the body cavities. You've got the cranial cavity, the thoracic cavity, the abdominal cavity, and the pelvic cavity. Core issues tend to manifest as tensions in these areas. The periphery, which is basically the upper and lower extremities, are about how we reach out into the world. Core stuff is about what is central. The word core refers to the relationship to the center. The periphery refers to what is surrounding or what is outside. Okay, <clears throat> so if I'm working with somebody who brings an issue like, let's say, um, it's hard for me to assert myself in my family, or it's hard to assert myself at work. This would be a peripheral issue. This is an issue about, it doesn't mean it's not uh, important, it just means it's related to the person's relationship to the outer world. So if a person brings that kind of issue to me, I want to be able to more, be more assertive and set boundaries. I'm going to look at how they organize in their shoulder girdle and their arms. I'm going to look at something to do with their periphery. <coughs> um, if the person comes to me and they said, say something like, you know, I'm just anxious, anxious a lot and I find myself really, you know, I'm an introverted person, I find myself getting very shy. Um, in, um, in social circumstances. So this is a, an external relationship, but it's an internal organizational pattern. So based on the stimulation of my environment, I tend to pull inside. So then I'm going to look actually, what's this person doing in their core? Because that introspective quality, that shyness, is often an issue internally. And in most cases, I'm simply just looking for where I'm drawn, where the juice is. So, <clears throat> the, the, the incredible value of being able to track the physical structure is that it already puts me in the ballpark of where a wound is and where a resource may be or a resource that's missing. So, instead of listening, instead of getting a very complex history, and I do take complex histories from my client, but instead of, ha instead of having to focus a lot on getting the history, I'm also getting a quick history just by looking at a person's body. I look at a person's body and I can tell a lot about how this person organizes inside simply by their posture or by their movements, by tracking their physical tension patterns. It requires a different way of looking and it requires a different kind of um, 
of education. But in many ways, it's very much like regular psychotherapy. As, as an experienced psychotherapist, I'm listening to the story, and within that story, I can pick out what are the central beliefs this person's organizing around. I just hear it. And any experienced therapist will be able to do that. Oh, I hear this. And based on this, I suspect that there was this developmental period that you were influenced by. You know, um, an example of that would be a person who has a very difficult time um, sensing their needs or asserting their needs. Well, there's this very early developmental period you know, around a, from, from shortly after birth to around age one, where if the person doesn't get their needs met or, or their needs, needs are randomly rejected, a distrust around that might happen. As that child gets a little bit older and they can start to actually have some assertiveness around that, they may very well go from this. This would be the, the physical form <coughs> of a person who, you know, this is a generalization, of course, but the physical form of a person who doesn't um, have much access to their needs will tend to be a collapse. Reich called this the oral period or the oral position. So there's a collapse through here. If I see that collapse through here, I know there's a core issue. It's probably associated with something around that developmental time. I'm not going to overlay that as a template, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to address, okay, what are you feeling in here? I might even come and do a little touch intervention to bring more focus to that place. So let's say I'm here. Um, the belief is, I, in fact, everybody do this. S sit up straight, put your feet on the ground, and I want you to say to yourself, I can't get what I want. This would, this would be a belief that orients to that developmental period. I can't get what I want. And notice what your body tends to do. Okay, let's hear some things about what does it do. Feel how it starts to collapse in there? Yeah. I just felt like And there's kind of, there could even be a kind of a hopelessness that arises from it. <coughs> okay, so now go back into that same place. I can't get what I want. And say to yourself, and I'm really pissed about it. And notice what your body does. This would be a slightly later developmental period. The person has that, that overarching belief in that period in the, you know, their first year, year and a half. But then as that little baby gets, you know, because babies, infants have a lot of energy. If that energy a little bit later in the developmental period gets focused on it, they're going to start to get pissed. So feel what your body does. I can't get my knees met and I'm pissed about it. What happens? What's the form of it? Okay, there's, okay, what do you notice happens in your jaw and your head? Jaw tightens, head comes forward. So instead of doing this, going into hopelessness or sadness or despair, I now organize with tension in the core and I'm pissed. Okay, now that anger, that frustration may very well subside because it might not have been welcome in the family. But I see a client who comes in like this. You know, just things aren't going well in my relationship, and it's just, I don't know what to do about it. They might not say I'm angry. They might not even feel the anger. The anger is more quiescent, held in within the system, but we can see it in the posture. We can see it in the tension pattern. Now, the importance of this is we still, just like in regular, more non somatic psychotherapy, we want to get in touch with the beliefs and resource and shift those beliefs. <coughs> but in this case, we have a very valuable tool. We can start to shift the form. And just like I was saying earlier, if you start to shift the form, something in the content of that is going to have to start to shift or the person is going to feel very uncomfortable. Those of you that have done long-term psychotherapy know that you can go through periods of quite a bit of discomfort as the transitions are happening. And that's a big part of what's happening. There is an incongruity between form and function. In somatic psychotherapy, we use this. We use this as a vehicle to get clarity.